you know, people always. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People, people always seem to be on time. So. Yeah, so we advertise for five, so. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, welcome uh, back, everyone. So, this is the first year of the Machine Learning and Dynamic Assistance uh, Seminar, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Nathan Kutz. I mean, I'm sure that everyone knows about him, so no need to introduce him. So today he'll be talking about the future of governing equations, dynamical models from data. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm here at the Turing Institute, uh, uh, sitting in one of the cubicles. So if you are uh, around, uh, just come look for me because I'm, I, you know, I float around this place quite a few of the days of the week. And more than happy to discuss uh, some of this further with you at, at any point. So just feel free to come find me here. Um, you know that. So first of all, the title isn't is not like I know the answer to this. It's more of a question that I want us to start thinking about and consider. Which is, uh, I grew up in a world of governing equations, and I I think about them all the time, and I know many of the people on this actually Zoom call, and I know that you think about them quite a bit. And so part of the goal here is to start thinking about uh, what we can start thinking about and how machine learning is going to play a role for us in thinking about building models from data. So uh, first, I want to start with this quote, because this is actually really important for us in this talk, which is it's it's really uh, what Einstein had put out there, that the the laws of nature uh, are expressed by equations hold good for all system of coordinates. So first of all, a lot of what he was talking about was I can change coordinate systems and really there has to be a consistency. And just because I change coordinate systems doesn't mean the physics change. It means that I could have multiple coordinate systems that all must agree with each other on what they're actually observing or the equations of motion might get be transformed in these coordinate systems, but they are in fact, all manifestations of the same thing. And so we're gonna build on that idea because that's really what machine learning is gonna allow us to do is to start thinking very broadly about coordinate systems to build with our models. And so here's the picture I want us to think about throughout the talk, which is what this talk's really gonna be about is taking data, dynamical data, especially like spatial temporal data that might have some system and learning the coordinate system in which to represent that dynamics. Let's call that the latent space. And so I measure, I have measurements of my system and I wanna learn an embedding of that, of that dynamics in a coordinate system. So really for us, a lot of the target is gonna be thinking about how to constrain the what a neural network does so I can explain it to you, but it also has a very targeted task, which is in this case, learn for me a really great coordinate system. Now, what does it mean to have a great coordinate system? It's part of what we're gonna discuss because we get to design the objective function or loss function for this. And so doing that makes a, a big difference. All right, so let's start off with this. So I wanna get concrete with this. So here's the night sky and you're looking here at the motion of the planet Saturn and Mars. So Mars is here in the foreground. And these are observations of the night sky over a long period of time. And this is one of the, this was physics. Explain to me the motions of the planets, right? So we've been observing the stars from as far as recorded history, we know. And part of the goal was to understand planetary motion. And celestial mechanics was sort of the, the most important and canonical um, physics problem that we have um, historically. And so the question is, how do you build a model for this? Well, the first successful model of this came out of Alexandria, Egypt, 150 AD. Uh, Alexandria was sort of, in some sense, the center point of intellectual and scientific development um, after its founding. Uh, Ptolemy, who was one of the generals of Alexander the Great, as Alexander swept through to Egypt, one of the things that happened is, uh, Alexander, you know, Egyptians were not open source knowledge people. They kept the knowledge to themselves. Uh, but then when Alexander that came there took all of the what they had in terms of a knowledge base and shared it broadly, including with people like Aristotle and his 
his followers, uh, this is the first time he had access to this knowledge base. And Alexandria itself became sort of the center point for intellectual activity and also, uh, you know, geometry. Euclid was there in th about 300 BC. And the, uh, the, the first uh, successful theory explaining the kind of motion became ultimately known as the doctrine of the perfect circle, which was planetary motion could be modeled as circles on circles. So Earth is the center of the coordinate system. And what happens like a planet Jupiter is going around some large orbit with smaller orbits. And so you can actually build circles on circles to describe this motion. Or another way to think about this, this is the earliest version of a Fourier transform. The only math you need is geometry. It's a very elegant theory and very successful at predicting planetary motion. And so this was the first successful theory about 150 AD. And, uh, you know, you see these beautiful paintings in the Renaissance of, of sort of this, of these planetary motions where the earth is, this, is the center. And of course, we typically think of this coordinate system as wrong, but in fact, uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute, right? So we we hadn't quite come up with gravity or calculus, but once once we start reframing the coordinate system, you start getting a different model. And so, what happened sort of really in this 1500s uh, is you have Galileo and Kepler uh, really building on reintroduction of this idea of a heliocentric universe by Copernicus. He was pushing this idea, but this was from all the way went all the way back to. Th uh, Aristarchus of Samos, who already proposed this deal, idea 300 BC. Um, and the only reason it didn't catch on, uh, or part of the reason it didn't catch on, is because the great um, uh, Syracusan, right, uh, uh, Archimedes, thought it was a preposterous idea. And that's actually the only evidence we have of this theory, is that Archimedes thought it was so clearly and so self-evident, a ridiculous idea, uh, and that's how we know that the theory was there. Um, and yet, our, uh, Copernicus picks this back up. We start thinking about changing coordinate system. And it's really Galileo and Kepler who pushed this to its conclusion. Uh, and once we have this new coordinate system, about 80 years later, comes along Isaac Newton, who now introduces a new mathematical construct that we call calculus and is able to posit our F equals MA physics. And of course, we think we've got this solved until we get better and better observation in the late 1800s and realize that, in fact, this is not quite the right theory. And Einstein proposes general relativity based upon observational data. So every time we've got better observation, we get better theories. And really what helped nail this down in the first place, this coordinate transformation, was the data that Tycho Brahe had actually collected that was inherited by Kepler himself. So this is this process of discovery, right? From Euclid having a geometry laid the found, and geometry had been down for a long time before that, but Euclid wrote the elements in about 300 BC, which is sort of this foundational mathematical uh, uh, manuscript, which basically pervaded all of the ancient world. Uh, and it took about 500 years before the Ptolemaic model came after that another 1500 years till Kepler, 87 to Newton, and then finally another 200 to Einstein. So what you're looking at is like a 2000 year history plus just to sort of get a reasonable model for this. And so part of the goal of AI is to shrink the time of discovery. We shouldn't be waiting 2000 years for discovery. We should be using the tools we have with us, these modern tools of computation, to try to really massively accelerate this discovery process. Let's quickly, quickly review. Model one is just this one here, which is in this paradigm, I take pictures of the night sky. I throw them into my neural network to learn a latent space. And that latent space is the Ptolemaic model. <clears throat> That's model number one. And by the way, the decoder maps it back out. So I can like do the dynamics in this latent space, which is essentially the Earth-centric system, and get back to the, uh, the full observations. <laughs> Model two is this here, where you throw in your data. Again, observations of the night sky. These could be pictures of the night sky. 
learn a low dimensional embedding, which is or uh, essentially the heliocentric coordinate system, and then learn that the dynamics in this is the inverse square law, F equals MA. Both models are perfectly valid. <laughs> in fact, that's the whole point of Einstein's statement. These are equivalent models, and they both hold. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, really, there's this interesting difference between Newton and Kepler, which is <coughs> Kepler is doing a curve fit, whereas Newton has a generative model for predicting planetary motion. <coughs> And this relates very strongly to modern machine learning, <coughs> in which we have two types of paradigms. I'll let you look at this for a minute. <coughs> in the robot, this is a physics-based model. It actually has all the physics embedded in it as it's doing its actions. It's kind of like a Newtonian model. In the self-driving car, it's a bank of sensors. And what it's learned from its sensors is how to interpolate the world around it. Both are highly successful. And I don't want to make too many comments about what's better than the other, but I'm going to stick mostly up top where I'm going to think about physics-based models. And that's where I want to spend most of my time is to think about how do I embed physics and dynamical systems knowledge into a system versus just interpolating? The important difference here, by the way, and this is related to um, Kepler and Newton, is that <clears throat> what Newton could do that Kepler couldn't is the Newtonian model. You could imagine something like going to the moon. You've never had a single data point to suggest you could do this. But with F equals MA, you can calculate how you might do it. And many hundreds of years after Newton, we actually did do it. We extrapolated into a regime where we launched someone, put them on the moon, and brought them back. Kepler is doing a curve fit. It doesn't allow for that kind of extrapolation. It's There's no training data that allow it to fit a curve of such a dynamic of putting somebody on the moon. OK, so these are differences that we have to start thinking about in terms of our model building. And at least for us, I think about the top one. But even if you have all this physics based models. Here's what you kind of have in practice, right? This thing here is a robot and you can start seeing that even with physics based models, right? The world is a little bit of uncertain place um, and you have maybe noisy measurements and there's all kinds of things that can happen in, in realistic settings. And these are, of course, look very, very human-like type failures in these robots, okay? So it's not like we're going to, if we have the right physics, we just get perfect behavior. You can see in, in, in real applications, you're basing everything upon measurements and a model that's imperfect. And so you actually get uh, realistic behaviors like this, which is you have failure modes. So let's talk about the mathematical architecture that we want to do. Uh, <clears throat> one of them, is in, this is it here. So what we're gonna do here with this math mathematical architecture is we want to take measurements of a system. So we're gonna stop start here in the bottom left. What we have are measurements, sensor measurements. And these sensor measurements can be very broad. The, 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 the best sensor measurement right now going is just your iPhone. You, know, you pull out your phone, you, you film physics. So like it's a cheap sensor, it's visual, it's interpretable. And you can take in data streams this way and start thinking about how do I build physics models just based upon I, I record the physics. It's observation. And this is exactly how we built most of our physics models is we first observe them. So we observe them, let's say, with a camera. And what your goal is, is to, from these observations, try to learn a mapping to the actual variables you should be using. Let's call this X, the state space variable. And then once you have the state space variable to learn its dynamics. So notice that you have to learn F, which is the dynamics. You have to learn X, which is the state space. And you have to learn H, which is the mapping from your measurements to this. 
this is a terribly ill post problem. And in general, there's no solution to this, right? There's, uh, it's just ill post. And so, or there's an infinite number of solutions to this. So the question is how are we gonna actually solve this? And the way you do this in machine learning is you regularize, you pr produce some uh, reasonable regularizations that would stabilize this entire process. So here's how that we might do this. Um, we actually impose this one, these here. Uh, and this is a very, let's say, engineering and physics-based regularization, which is what we want are models that are interpretable and parsimonious. Why do we want that? Because we've had so much success with this. Think about Maxwell's equations. They fit on a t-shirt, right? We can buy a t-shirt with Maxwell's equations. This is, a, this is amazing. It models all this electromagnetic phenomena and yet it's it's a very simple, in many ways, model for all of that dynamics. Quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation is three terms, uh, right? Navier-Stokes, three terms. So what we believe is that a parsimonious model, uh, especially because most things we observe have dominant balanced physics, is a reasonable way to go. And interpretable models obviously are helpful because that's what really allows us to take big extrapolation links. Uh, steps in building new technologies. And so these ideas are old. They go all the way back to William of Ockham, who was very much about proposing nominal models, propose something that's sufficiently uh, descriptive of the data, but as simple as possible. And you see this throughout history, especially from Ockham onwards, although people had phrased this in different ways even before that, you know, uh, all the way to Pareto, where you have, uh, when you do model selection, there's what's called the Pareto frontier and Pareto optimals models, right? So these ideas have been around for quite a bit. And it's all about thinking about how do I build a model on the data? But I don't want just any model out of the infinity of models, giving me the model that has sort of this smallest footprint in terms of number of terms or dimensions. And that for us is the ultimate physics regularization. So we want to build a model that can be in as low dimensional space as possible with as few terms as possible. And that's how we have built most of our physics infrastructure that we have in the world today. So that's what we're going to go after. And we want to find things like governing equations, which is, of course, what the topic of the talk is. So let's talk about this. So let me give you a paradigm model. And this is actually going to start highlighting just because I made that statement about finding parsimonious models. You're going to see that already we're going to still have choices to have to be made. So let's take as a paradigm what you see here, which is the Berger's equation. So it's from the 1940s, and people were studying shock waves at this time. And so Berger's equation here has basically, a, a, you, you know, you have this UUX term. So you have a, you know, essentially a wave that's going to start steepening and create a shock. And then you regularize it with, uh, with a diffusion term. Let's call this our truth. Like that's the underlying physics. Well, one of the things that we learned in 1950, Cole and Hoff independently learned that you could actually transform that equation to a heat equation. So the fantastic part about this is this nonlinear PD, which I couldn't solve by hand. So I'd have to do simulations. And by the way, that was hard to do in the 1940s. <laughs> now I transform it to this heat equation, which I can solve analytically. So you could say, I've just done a better job of representing this in a better coordinate system. And this gets to the storyline. These two models are equivalent. They have different coordinate systems. One of them, I can write down the solution. The other one, I cannot. But by the way, even if I gave you the heat equation, you know, you could look at, let's say, maybe a, a solution to this, which would be solving this thing with an eigenfunction expansion. And so, you know, here's a representative solution of the heat equation. In fact, why would I learn the PDE when I could just directly learn the solution? In fact, I'd only sum it to n, not infinity. Or here's the solution itself. So all of these are different representations, or as Einstein would put it, different coordinate systems to represent this physics. You could even represent it from a numerical discretization point of view. So here's all these options. And the question is, what should be learned? When you're training a neural network, especially that first autoencoder, you're the one who gets to determine a loss function and an, opt uh, and an objective function. And so right away, you have to make a decision. Maybe you want to 
I mean, maybe you should just learn a linear model. Maybe you should just learn the solutions directly, right? These are the kind of things you have to start thinking about in building these models. Another way also to think about this is that a governing equation is sort of like DNA, right? From it, you can build everything. So if, if there's a system governed by um, this Berger's equation, you give me a new initial condition and boundary conditions, I can simulate it. And so the DNA sort of, you can sort of like think about it as the governing equation is the, the basic building block of generating all possible solutions. <clears throat> and as you change the <clears throat> initial condition and boundary condition, <clears throat> you get a different outcome. And it's kind of like DNA based on nature and nurture, you get a different person. So this is the full instantiation of running simulation from that DNA to a person in some sense. And you can learn lots of representations, right? Do you want to learn this representation, learning features of fully developed people? Or do you want to learn the DNA itself? Okay, so these are, again, options that you have in the learning process. And then this goes right back to here. Right away, we get back to Einstein and the choice is yours. If anybody on this call might have a preference, well, that's your preference. You could put it in your loss function and you decide what you want to learn. And it's equivalent to a different representation. And so we're going to play this on this equation here because notice what we're doing. We're taking a measurement and I want to learn a model. So I have to learn a triplet. I have to learn how to map to the state space <clears throat> and then the dynamics of the state space. But I can force different things to happen in the dynamics. And by doing so, I get a different state space and a different measurement model. So these are all going to be coupled together in how we learn. And by the way, there are limits to this. You cannot, med you cannot build models for things you cannot observe. So any physics that's below your measurement capability, I mean, this is a little bit obvious. But it's also something that we've studied just to really nail this down, which is anything that's beyond your measurement will be often indistinguishable from noise or stochastic fluctuations. And it's not because it's really noisy or stochastic down there. It's because you don't have the ability to measure beyond a certain level. Okay, so your sensor limitations actually limit your, your physics itself. So let's start off with the simplest model to build, linear models. So what I want to do is actually go ahead and start this process. And I want to go ahead and constrain my model, whatever coordinate system, I want the dynamics to be linear. And so here you go. Why do I want linear? Because I actually know how to solve it. This is why we did the Kohlhoff transform. Because once you have a linear model, you can just write down the analytic solution. And just like here, if I can approximate this by some X tilde, as a linear model, then I could just find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A, and I'm I have the solution. Okay, so that's one way to do this. And one of the easiest approximation techniques to do uh, for a linear model is the dynamic mode decomposition. And I want to highlight here the work of Dia uh, and Travis, who built out what we call the bagging optimized dynamic mode decomposition, which is a way to take snapshots of data. Here they are coming into your system. This could be video. It could be some spatial temporal field you're measuring or even just a single time course. And from it to do a direct fitting to the solution of a linear model, which is essentially this here. Just assume that the solution is of this form because that's the solution of a linear equation. And you do variable projection to fit the, the data to this. And by doing bagging, statistical bagging, you can make it very robust, even when you have noisy measurements. And by the way, all of this is built into this Pi DMD package you can download. I'm going to actually be talking quite a bit about uh, DMD for those of you interested. I'm going to do a little uh, tutorial on it here uh, in the upcoming weeks uh, at, at Turing. So if you want to learn how to use it and um, play around with the package, uh, I'll walk it through. So it's great because it's super fast. I'm not training a neural net. I'm just doing a straight regression. Uh, we can also do more fancy things like this, which is instead of what we did there, you learn a neural network that takes you from the original measurement space to a latent space where in that latent space, I want a latent space where when you move from time K to K plus one, or you take steps in the future, 
that the evolution itself is linear. So we're going to force it to learn a coordinate system so that the dynamics is linear. And this is work with Bethany Lush, and she trained the first models of this. And so, for instance, think about flow around the cylinder. This is spatial temporal data. And we can look at this in some low dimensional space. And, you know, which is generically nonlinear, but we can say, well, let's train this autoencoder to warp that space so that the dynamics in the new latent space is linear. And you can exactly do this with this flow around the cylinder. So all of a sudden you put yourself in a coordinate system where this nonlinear dynamics is now linear. And of course, this one here is quite low dimensional and easy. And actually, if you're going to do one, you could do it. But you can also do much more complicated spatial temporal systems like the kerr moda shivashinsky equation, which displays spatial temporal chaos, yet even that system, you can approximate the dynamics with a linear model. And this is what Craig Jinn did. And this is very similar to what you would do with PDE theory, or what's called inverse scattering transform. The inverse scattering transform is typically thought, to, uh, you know, theoretically to work only with completely integral PDEs, which is a small class of PDEs. Um, but this suggests you can do this embedding, this linearization embedding, which much more uh, broad range of PD systems. And so uh, this is still a very surprising result to me. And I think there's a lot of interesting mathematics to follow up on this one here. You can also build Green's functions. So Green's functions were uh, quite popular in the 80s and 90s. And until everybody had widespread computing, Green's functions were a fantastic way to get fundamental solutions to linear problems. But as soon as we started doing nonlinear problems because we had computers, you know, people left this behind. But really then what I'm telling you is you could say, well, if it's a nonlinear problem, why don't I warp it into a linear problem? Then I can still use all the Green's function technologies that I had before. And this is exactly what Dan Shea showed you could do. So notice everything there, we were warping space. You could also warp time. So what do I mean by that? This is what Henning Longa did. And he what he said is, look, here's a, here's a time varying signal. And, you know, typically if you want to, you know, try to do a forecast with this with Fourier modes or even using something like DMD, which is basically looking at exponentials in time, sharp structures <coughs> like this will create, set up a structure where there's a lot of Fourier modes you have to use. So what if instead you said, look, this still looks fairly periodic. What if I warped the signal in time to make it as sinusoidal as possible with as few frequencies as possible. So here's what this is now. The Koopman operator, unlike Fourier, which is Fourier is just fitted to sines and cosines. Koopman operator here says, learn a warping. And that's the F of theta. That's my neural net that learns how to warp time in order to make my signal as sparse in Fourier modes as possible. And so this is a fantastic way to do this because essentially this gives you this all the power of Fourier decompositions, but it also takes the data and puts it into, it makes the data perfectly suitable for Fourier decompositions. So it's a really nice uh, leveraging of these two techniques. And so you can start seeing here when we start doing forecasting on power grids, which is, you know, kind of quasi periodic chaotic data. This coupon forecast techniques beats everything, including all the state-of-the-art neural network architectures like LSTM, echo state networks, um, data recurrent units, as well as the statistical, classical st statistical methods like ARIMA and so forth. So it's a really powerful concept because it gets us back to Fourier modes, which we know are fantastic for long-range forecasting. And then you can do things like this, make improved reduced order models, because now what you can do is take something like what you have up top, which is a full PDA simulation of this cavity driven flow. And if you look at the low dimensional subspace of this, you know, doing something like the singular value decomposition, you find that the dynamics is sort of quasi periodic. Well, you warp that to Fourier modes, and then you actually have this really nice reduced order model. And the reduced order model now, if you want to do a long range prediction, you can, you know, you know if you want to predict 10 million units into the future, unlike reduced order models where you have to march your solution 10 million into the future. Here, since you have the Fourier mode, you can say, oh, you wanted it time 10 million, but T equals 10 million, you're done. It's a one-step process. And it's very accurate. 
and it's stable by construction. So this is a really nice uh, way to think about how to improve uh, 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 your model just by simply making it coordinate transformation of time in order to make things fit towards Fourier modes. All right, so those are the ideas of linear models. Remember, I had the choice to make. And what I wanted to show you in that first section was just say, look, I can just basically say, take my data, build me the best linear model. Find me a coordinate system in which a linear model is really as good as possible, right? So it's gonna find me a very different coordinate system than the second part, which is now what I wanna do is switch that and say, well, I could have a nonlinear model, but what I want in my nonlinear models is I want something parsimonious like we had talked about before. And so I wanna come back to this. And now the enforcement is gonna be, you see this F here? Whatever dynamics I have, there can only be a few terms over there. And this is all motivated from our physics models, right? We can fit Maxwell's equation on a t-shirt. Schrodinger has three terms, Navier-Stokes three terms. You just start listing all of our canonical physics models in which we've built entire industries and technologies. And typically, there's just very few terms in the in the model that really un, uh, highlight the, the 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 most important dominant physics. That's what we want here. Is we want to say, find me a coordinate transformation that gets me a model here with just has a few terms. Okay, so what few terms? Well, what could it be? Well, we can make a library. We've seen lots of physics models. Everybody on this call is probably overeducated, has had a lot of experience learning models, right? And so you take all that vast knowledge you have and say, hey, there's models for this kind of uh, dynamics, this kind of dynamics, others. You just build a library of all the kind of models you have seen. So what could it be, right? When we think about this, dx dt equals f, I don't know what f is, but I'm gonna build a library of candidates. And this is only limited by your imagination. Turns out polynomials work very well. Why? Because of the idea of dominant balance physics. Anytime we measure something, we're typically looking at a, a, a parameter regime where there's a few terms that dominate the dynamics. And often you can think about if I tailor expanded around there, I would get polynomials. In fact, that seems to work for almost all our physics models as well. And so what we've built is this called sparse identification of nulling dynamics. So Cindy, and what Cindy is, by the way, let me just really help frame this. All Cindy is, is AX equal to B. It's a linear regression. The matrix A in AX equal to B is the library of candidate terms. Okay, so for instance, here, I'm going to give you the Lorenz attractor. I'm going to give you X, Y, and Z, the, just the data sets, the time series data. And what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, from that time series data, uh, I'm going to construct a, a library of potential functions. That's this matrix here. This is the candidate function. So that's the matrix A in AX equal to B. B itself is if I give you the time series data, you're going to produce the derivative. Remember, I'm finding X dot equals F of X. If I give you X, you can produce X dot. By the way, that's harder than it looks because if I give you noisy data, differentiating noisy data is, is extremely challenging. And that's one of the hardest things about making this work in practice is if you want to go to a system where you don't have really good clean measurements or you have noise, realistic noisy measurements, producing good derivative estimates is ultimately your biggest challenge. Okay. So that's B. A is the candidates. B is the differentiated data. And then the final thing you're solving for, the AX equal to B, the X is actually the coefficient in front of each library term. And this is where we do the magic. We simply say, look, out of all these potential terms that could be modeling this system, give me the fewest necessary to fit the data. So we're going to promote sparse regression on this AX equal to B. Technically, we'd want to promote the L0 norm, but typically in practice, everybody uses the L1 norm as a proxy for sparsity or the L0 norm. And so that's exactly what we do. And the way we actually do it is to, we've actually developed quite a few different sparse sparsity promoting techniques here. But when you do this, what you see here, these balls are the non-zero elements that are left over. And in fact, I give you Lorenz, it recovers Lorenz. And so you can do things like this. I give you data. 
and I ask the question, here's some data, spatial temporal data. Tell me what PDE produced that data. And when you do this regression architecture, again, you can find all these models. And these are the ones I learned in grad school. So the what I prejudiced you with here is my grad school education, which is here's all these PDEs I was learning when I was in applied math. Okay. And this is work by Sam Rudy. And by the way, we have a Python package called PyCindy. And we just put out a, a second version of it last year. And it's got a ton of examples. It's super easy to use. Um, I'd encourage you to use it. it. You can just download pip install it. It's not that hard. And it's got a bunch of examples that you can play around with in there uh, to do some of this. Okay. So uh, that is the model discovery piece. And we're building nonlinear models that are parsimonious. Okay. Now, up to this point, by the way, I swept one thing under the rug, which is in this Cindy modeling, I assumed that I had the right variable I was measuring. What we really want to do is back that up a little bit and say, well, wait a minute, what if I just measured it from data and I don't really know what the right variable is? And so this is what Kathleen Champion worked on. And what she did is we come back to that infrastructure that I showed you from the very first slide. There's an autoencoder learning a representation of a, of a latent space and then coming back out. And what we're going to do with this is start pairing it together so that the pressure on this neural network is to say, find a, not, <clears throat> find a transformation <laughs> to as low dimensional a space as possible, where in that low dimensional space, I'm going to make Cindy happen. In other words, I'm going to find a parsimonious representation of the dynamics. So you put the Cindy model in the latent space. And here's the entire loss function for training. The canonical example of this is the following. What you're seeing here is a pendulum. There it is going around. So this is video. The, the computer has no idea what this video of us, all it says is light changes in the video, but this is our input to the data. In other words, a video stream that comes in, which is pixel space. And so now what you're gonna do is enforce in the latent space, the small dimensions, and you're gonna make it give you parsimonious model for this physics. And so what it's forced to learn is it's actually learns by making that happen. It is forced to learn theta, theta dot. It had no idea what theta, theta dot was, <laughs> but it learns it because you enforced sparsity in the model and this is the model it learns in there so this is the pressure on the latent space to learn a parsimonious model cascades backward through back propagation to learn theta theta dot and map you back out to the full pendulum so this may seem easy but this is like state of the art right here going directly from video having the video learn the coordinate system and learn the parsimonious dynamics. And this is a hard problem. And it's hard because when you take real video, it's actually really hard. If you have synthetic data, it's a lot easier. But when you go to real data, remember you're trying to differentiate noisy data. And here the challenge is the shading, the lighting. The lighting is changing as this pendulum is swinging. It creates all kinds of issues with actually trying to make it work in practice. Okay, so to handle the noise issue, <clears throat> we've actually worked really hard at this uh, because if if you build an algorithm that works very nicely, let's say, let's say to a math to a mathematician's delight, which means it works in principle, it's a nice elegant idea, it's fine. But really, if you want to take a reduction to practice, you have to make the engineer happy, which is the engineer typically has real data real constraints on how much data and you have to make it work even when things aren't as as elegant as you would like them to be and so i want to highlight the work of urban fazel on what we had been doing to really advance the state of the art by doing ensemble cindy which is now what we do we do very much like what statistical bagging does you build a suite of models by ensembling the models in order to get uh stabilize the model prediction and get more of a uh, even uncertainty quantification in your model itself. And by the way, Urban is at Imperial College, which is 
you know, 25 minutes up the road from here. And so I see him quite a bit. He was a former postdoc at the AI Institute, and he's now here in London. And we are continuing uh, to do work along these lines. And more recently, Mars Gao, who is another student, he basically took that same idea, but then built a full Bayesian version of this. And what you're seeing there is the full loss function. And the Bayesian version of this is much more robust than almost anything else we've tried. Because what you're doing is you're not doing a hard uh, sparse regression. Uh, the Bayesians, right, They all their answers are a PDF. You know, right, the way they frame all their answers is, and here's the PDF, that's the answer. And so what you're doing here is you're building a library, but you're actually computing a probability of inclusion and a statistical distribution of every single library term. And so what you end up getting is a, a much more robust view of the data discovery process and it's super stable. This actually works pretty nicely with real video data as well. So I guess, you know, I've shown you how to use this on, let's say, a video of a pendulum. And you might think that's very uh, low level. It's actually at the current point is sort of a state of the art. But where we have taken this now, and this is going to be a paper that's going to show up on the archive here, is towards uh, a modeling framework where we don't know the answers, which is computational neuroscience. And I'm going to give you this example here. Uh, so you see here, it's this uh, Ryan Rout who's working uh, with myself and some colleagues at University of Washington. And it's actually not up on the archive. It'll be up there in like a month, something like that. So if you want to read this, it's a fascinating paper. <clears throat> so what they do is they have a mouse and they are making all kinds of observations on this mouse while it is uh, it is doing some behavioral tasks. And so what they monitor, for instance, is retinal movement of the eye. They monitor full uh, uh, calcium imaging, hemoglobin on the brain. And what we decided to do with this is to say, is there a common latent representation, or in other words, some underlying dynamical system that's ultimately responsible for what we observe in the retina fluctuations, in the brainwave activity? And that's exactly what we did. We took this data and we trained, it's very much like the architecture I just showed you, take an autoencoder to learn a latent space, and then come back out. But here, what we're going to do is we want to map from one measurement type to another. And we want a latent dynamics that allows this mapping to happen. In other words, find me some low rank subspace on which, which is consistent with uh, calcium imaging data and retinal eye fluctuations. And in fact, that's exactly what Ryan was able to do. So here's a, here's a, a little movie. What you're looking on the left is the actual uh, brain wave activity, calcium imaging activity. And on the right is the prediction you get from just looking at the pupil di dilations. And so this thing here tells you something quite interesting. You can watch what's happening on the retina and infer the brain activity quite accurately, in fact. Okay, so that's the that was the goal of this is to do this and, and show this. And in fact, we can even go broader and show that you could take the retinal activity and with that, you can map it to all these different measurement types that they have, which included, you know, blood oxygen level, um, <clears throat> metabolism, uh, neural calcium. All of these map to a common latent low dimensional subspace on which the dynamics is occurring. And so that same architecture we used for the pendulum is used right here on a system, which is much, which we would all say is much more complex and that we don't even have governing equations for. And yet this is getting us a step closer to start to understand brain dynamics itself, that in fact, it's encoded in low dimensional spaces. And all these things we measure are manifesting this low dimensional dynamics uh, it, that's that's what this clearly suggests is happening. The thing we're doing now is trying to do model discovery on what is the dynamics of what's there. That's a little trickier because there's all kinds of control signals. It's not it's not like an open loop dynamical system. It's being actuated by a bunch of input stimulus, and so that's the more challenging part of that, which we are actually trying to untangle at this point. 
So this gets us into like, you know, taking these techniques to real applications. And, and again, more, more evidence of this is just, I can watch what's happening when the retina and reconstruct, you know, hemoglobin, uh, oxygen levels and calcium imaging across the entire brain, which is, I, I just think that's quite remarkable. Okay, so up to this point, by the way, here's something I've assumed. I assumed that uh, I knew nothing about physics, right? I just said, take the data, learn physics. But most of the time, this is actually the relevant application we're interested in, which is called discrepancy modeling, which is I actually no part of the physics. I know most of the physics even maybe, but whatever physics I know, I have some gaps in my physics knowledge. The data doesn't quite match my model. And so discrepancy modeling, and this is work with Cardi and Megan here, uh, is the idea is to start not from scratch, but with whatever knowledge you might have. You might know, hey, look, I know there's conservation of mass and momentum in the system, which produces these kind of terms. It's just that I, I'm missing some terms. So this is what I know. It's not good enough. How do I learn the missing physics? And so you can use this Cindy architecture here exactly how it did before. Remember, Cindy was a regression to dxt equals a library of elements. But now the regression is, all I have to do is take my known physics, f of x, move it to the left-hand side. So my regression isn't to the, to the derivative. The regression is to x dot minus f of x, and then I posit a library of possibilities for the unknown physics, and then do the regression. So where is this especially important it's really important for things like digital twins so here as you're looking at the digital twins uh, you know what you're looking at on the left is the digital twin of this robot arm but if you're doing high uh, high precision manufacturing the platonic model which is this robot arm on the left does not match the right the data on the right, the real robot. Why? Because, well, there's frictional forces. There's all kinds of small differences. This is a I, totally idealized model where this is reality, right? This is your real robot. So if you're going to make a digital twin, what you really need to do is put sensors on here, start learning the discrepancy between them, and then say, well, look, I will improve my model by just looking at the actual physics versus my... Uh, Platonic physics, and then learning a, a model to make uh, this, this match better. So you learn the discrepancy itself. So that's an important application uh, of this as well. I'm going to finish with just some thoughts here on uh, sensing and reduced order models, because a lot of what we do here, right, is we're, you know, in some sense, we're trying to figure out how to build models from data. And the fact is, if you go to real data systems, you very rarely can actually monitor the whole system. You put sensors and locations, that's where you get your data. You still wanna build good proxy models for that data. And so I wanna highlight one architecture that's been highly successful for us and then finish. And this is this what's called a shallow recurrent decoder network. And this is work with Jan Williams, who is actually here at the Turing. I brought him over with me this year. So he's gonna be around. So if you wanna to talk to Jan, He's floating around uh, the hallways here. Uh, and what we decided to do is say, okay, look, the number one trick in solving a PDE analytically, typically that we learn in textbooks, is we learn separation of variables. So you say, I have this spatial temporal field, write it down as a product of a, uh, of of a spatial and a temporal uh, function. And so this shallow recurrent decoder does exactly that. What it does is it writes, your, it basically constructs your solution as a temporal component glued to a spatial component. And what's interesting about this is we're going to, you know, we can basically start thinking about what we're going to do is we're going to trade out spatial measurements for time history measurements. And of course, in a linear model, you can show that these are equivalent. So in other words, you can measure lots of spatial points as equivalent to one point with a bunch of, uh, uh, with a trajectory information. And so this is exactly what this architecture does. And so consider the following. I have snapshots of a flow. This is turbulent flow. So it's a very difficult problem. And these dots here, the pink, the blue, the yellow, are measurement locations where I take the time history there. 
Well, the time history itself encodes information about the entire domain. But we feed in the time measurements of these sensors, and here's what it might look like through the LSTM, which is a sequential model, right, temporal model. And we take the latent space of that LSTM and feed it through a decoder network, which maps it back to the full state high dimensional system. Okay, so provided you have these training pairs, what you're doing is building a map from time trajectory histories of a limited number of measurements directly to full state measurements. And this architecture is remarkable for a couple reasons. One, what we have found is it simply doesn't care where you measure the system. You can randomly pick locations. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of my last 15 years looking at optimal sensor locations in for measuring spatial uh, spatial temporal systems. And what this does is says, well, actually, you don't have to worry about that. Pick any locations you want. It doesn't matter because any location with enough time history tells you about the global information and is equivalent to a sensor in a good location. It's all about the time history that really matters. And so you start seeing here uh, that here's the ground truth. And here is this, what we call it shred, which is a shallow recurrent decoders with three sensors. You Three sensors, you're able to reconstruct even this isotropic turbulent flow. Versus if you lose the standard linear reduction methods like proper orthogonal decomposition or SVD, it just does a terrible job. You can never even get close to the performance of this shred architecture. And so this gives you a new paradigm. And notice we walked away from interpretability altogether, although we kept and preserved this low rank type structure in the neural network encoding architecture. And so uh, maybe I'll just stop there because I, I think I wanna give a little time for questions as we go. And in fact, I see a bunch of things in the chat, so I'll have to go uh, look to see what's there, but I'll, I'll stop there and I guess uh, take questions. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you. All right. Yeah, so, so feel free to unmute yourself to ask directly questions if you want to. I have a question. Yes. About the library of possibilities or probabilities. Yeah. Yep. How, maybe you can tell us more about it. Maybe it's too simple, but how that compared to scenario analysis? Uh, I don't know if I know anything about scenario analysis. Uh, so that that's- a You go part. from worst case to best case and you kind of draw a big probability curve, and each scenario, each little interval there, gets some kind of value of probability. Like extreme case gets mm -hmm. very low probability. Yeah, so we, we don't do anything like the scenario planning. What we mostly do is, you know, right, this, you're basically doing this Cindy regression. Now that's an X equals B, over the entire trajectory that you measured, right? So you may have, uh, you maybe go from time zero to T in a thousand steps and you're looking for the model that fits over that entire trajectory, right? Which is a big, uh, that really limits the possibilities because over a long period versus a small step, you have to have a model that can go thousands of steps, let's say, and fit the model still. And so, the libraries we typically construct, we always start off with polynomials because ultimately dominant balanced physics dictates that that's, pro, that's that's usually what works well. And so we start there and sometimes you can just start with a linear model, add quadratics, add cubics until you get something that actually fits that data over the entire course. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Uh, how do you... Uh, for the autoencoders, how do you uh, enforce the latent space? So, for example, if I want a latent space of uh, in three dimensions, uh, how uh, how do you differentiate between say x, y, and z, and x, y, and t, or x and derivatives of x, and so on? Yeah. So here, so what we do typically uh, to enforce the space of this latent space is we hyperparameter tune. 
to see how much, how far down can we get this thing? So in other words, in the case of a pendulum, for instance, you can squish this down to two, theta and theta dot. We didn't know that ahead of time necessarily. Like, I mean, okay, it's a pendulum. We knew what the answer was, but you can always do a rank estimation of your spatial temporal data and then start from there and see how far you can go down before your error spikes. So that determines the, the sort of degrees of freedom of your system. And from there, for instance, in this case, when you look at the variables it, look, it, it finds, you can clearly see they are theta, theta dot. Now, this is a nice case because it's like a rediscovery case. We know what the answer is. What becomes more interesting is even in this case, it's discovering these variables, right? Uh, here, let me show you the latent space, right? It's discovering this and we know what these things are called. But our hope is, as we learn more, we might be able to give these names, right? This is a case where we don't know the answer. So now we have to interpret what is this latent space it's giving us? But we pinch it down as far as possible. And here we can pinch it all the way down to three, three dimensions, which is, just, I, I think it's quite remarkable, uh, given usually what we think of as very complex behavior of networks of neurons on the brain, which are ultimately responsible for the uh, the imaging you see there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is fascinating. Uh, looking forward to the paper. Um, I have a que uh, two questions. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, my first question is, I just wanted to make sure I understand correctly. Uh, you say that uh, every model is linear. What matters is the coordinates we are working on. Is that correct? Say, say that again. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, we can consider every model as linear, that what really matters is the coordinates we are working on. Is that correct? Yes, yes. yes. In fact, so the, the, the big thing here is when you learn a coordinate system, you're typically enforcing what do you want happening in that coordinate system. So for instance, in, in this pendulum example, we've done it two ways. One is we could say, take the video, learn a nonlinear model. So you learn a coordinate system that takes you to the actual pendulum equations, theta and theta dot. We also said, how about I want to learn a coordinate system that learns a linear model. You can also do that as well. So you can transfer this and you can learn the pendulum all the way up to the saddle point. The saddle point is tricky to handle because now you have this second fixed point in a system and a linear model only has a single fixed point. But you can linearize the pendulum all the way up there um, and so you have two equivalent representations of the pendulum. One is this Cindy model. Another one is just a Koopman model, which is here's a linear model of the pendulum all the way up to this point here. Normally, we just model the linear pendulum as when it's small amplitude fluctuations. But here it says I can go to very large amplitude fluctuations and still get a linear model. They are equivalent. It's all about what do you want, right? That's the thing. Like You get to pick that loss function there. And if you want a linear model, make it linear. If you want a nonlinear model, nonlinear models have the advantage that you can go, you can walk through bifurcations. But linear mm -hmm. models are so simple, right? They're just really simple to work with. Yeah, thank you. My second question is, um, what do you do when you have a bunch of data and you have no idea of any kind of physics behind the data? Uh, what's 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 the interplay between the dynamics of uh, the x the t equals uh, some linear model times x and the data you have at hand? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, this this to me is the ultimate mm -hmm. representation of where we're at with that, which is what we know right now for this system is everybody maps to this common latent space. All this neural activity you see in this mouse the retina, the whiskers, the brain imaging, they all indicate a common dynamical system that's super low dimensional with simple trajectories that's somehow embedded in this mouse. And all of a sudden we're at this point, which is like, well, what does that mean? We clearly see something very important here, but now we have to kind of walk this back and figure out, we have to interpret this now. So in general, this is a perfect example of a system where we don't know the physics, we don't know the dynamics, but we got the first big clue. There's the space it's in. 
if that makes sense. And then, you know, as this work progresses, we hope we can say something more intelligent, right? Like, hey, and here's this model and maybe we can start understanding it. I mean, the nice thing about real physics systems is that typically we can understand things like theta, theta dot and momentum and mass. But when you go to biology, I mean, I don't know. Biology is really hard. So. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, so my question is that when you do the, uh, you go into the latent space and it has uh, taken it into these three variables or four variables in this case, how do you know these are actually representing the points in retina, retina there? In you the mean here, uh, the, this, this space here? Yeah. Yeah, so you are you, there are some points like four points on the eye. So we don't know what these latent space coordinates are. They are not equivalent, right? No, so these four points on the eye are measuring mm -hmm. essentially the eye fluctuation okay. during behavioral task. And so the time series for those are here. So this is what's happening at these points. So in other words, as the as the mouse is doing activity, the eye is fluctuating. And then okay. we map it over to the latent space where this is happening. And then you could say, well, now let's look at trajectories here. Let's go forward in time. And I'm going to map it back and tell you what's happening on the brain. Oh, yeah. I, I think I got confused with the color of that because they have the same color. So I thought, like, how can you say that? Because in latent space, they are, there's a transformation in the coordinates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I could have done that better. Daniel. Oh, by the way, everybody on the call, here's the other guy who's made a huge transformative impact. So Daniel Messenger, who says he's going to ask a question here in a minute. Urban and Daniel are two really important, uh, in my view, people who contributed to Cindy uh, in terms of really making it realistic. Daniel had done a, a version of Cindy uh, where he built a weak formulation, which helps you get around the derivative estimate problem, really helps quite a bit with the problem and then urban does the ensembling and i'd say the state of the art is to use the combo of what urban and daniel did so you uh, ensemble on the weak form and that's your best shot of getting a great model for a dynamic system that you don't know about so with that uh there uh dan you have a question yeah thanks um yeah actually my, my question has nothing to do with the the weak form or the combination with ensembling which is really awesome but um I was curious for the autoencoder architecture, this might be a, a stupid question, but um, how often do you have to back out to the physical space? Can you, can you train your architecture to allow you to do really long simulations in the latent space and then back out basically whenever you want? Or is it beneficial to do this more rapidly? Yeah, it's a good question. So let's, let's talk about it from two perspectives. There is the there is the online and offline. On the offline stage, when you're just training this, right, the more snapshots you have to train on, right? Uh, actually, if you if you look at the way we trained a lot of these, like especially for the linear models, we would say like go in through the autoencoder, take you know not just one step, but like take ten steps in there, and then come back out and see does it map correctly to ten steps in the real variable. So we train with a diversity like that. But the hope is once you've trained the model, what you really want to do is say from the retinal movement, I get myself into the autoencoder. And the whole point of having this low dimensional space, right, is then I want to walk way out into the future and make a forecast because this is a cheap forecast to make is this variable. And then I come back out then. Okay. Yes. But, but presumably you've trained on lots and lots of pairs, short, small, medium delta T's that you walk through to make it really robust. But yeah, what you really want to do is use the latent space to do long time rollouts. Gotcha. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to talk more about this. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hello. Yes. Uh, can I? Very good talk. Thank you. Uh, I've been uh, looking at uh, uh, Professor Friston's work on dynamic causal models and energy yeah. functionals. Uh -huh. Uh, seems somewhat related to your work, but can you comment on the connection or differences? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, we've just recently started to push in this direction. I hesitate to say much, except for Tristan is really interesting in the sense that 
I, in fact, I was just listening to a podcast of his, right? He's across the street. So maybe I'll go poke over there and knock on his door and talk to him at some point. But, uh, you know, in this podcast, he really talks about building models. And he, and again, he, he really highlights the importance of minimally parametrized models, which is exactly what you're trying to do in these latent spaces. Like build a model that is has parsimony talks about parsimony in his modeling paradigm as well. So that's one of the common themes that ha Friston proposes as well as we do it too. Now he does it more in terms of these, uh, uh, you know, energy settings, a free energy variational setting that he, he constructs. And so I, I, it's, it's a little bit of different architecture, but there's some really clever ideas there. Maybe hopefully you can connect these together at some point down the road. Uh, I've been listening to some of his po podcasts recently to try to understand exactly what he's doing uh, and see if we can connect it here. Okay, but thank you. Because, is definitely uh, a common theme. Because the state space, it has, it has very rigorous mathematics, right? And it has been studied by people mostly in control. Uh, yeah. And their notion of identifiability is actually stronger but very closely related to your comment about what's measurable. Yes, uh, yes. So I think there's some very useful, I think there's some very useful cross-pollination possibilities. Uh, that's my hunch, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that we really wanna push on for future work is you know, going back to the people who have been some of the best state space estimators in the world, they're typically control theorists, right? Uh, and so we would love especially this problem I'm showing you right here. How do you bring control in? Because in fact, again, this mouse is not just in open loop. This mouse is being stimulated. Uh, and so that's like a control signal. And so we don't quite know how to like disentangle that within the framework automatically yet. And we're hoping to learn how to do that as we go forward is to start to say, there's a dynamical system there that's being actuated. And really what I want to get after is the dynamical system and disambiguate what I see in my measurement, disambiguate what is an actuation signal and what is uh, the dynamic signal, and pull them apart. All right, so other questions? Or? Yeah, one, one question. Um, hi, Nathan, this is Christoph Brun. Nice to, nice to see you. Hey, Thanks good to see you. Talk. It was really, really amazing. Uh, I think the collection of, of topics you showed is really, really great. And I think the, the story is also extremely clear. Um, so I think the, the most fascinating example I've seen in your talk is actually what we see on the slides right now. I think it's really impressive to, to get that, that latent space. I think in medical imaging, I've seen similar, similar tries, but I think that it works really so closely is, is, is impressive. Um, so I'm wondering if you have observed through the study or in maybe one of the other projects, um, the question of coordinate learning or coordinate networks. So I see right now a lot in computer graphic, computer vision, people working on implicit neural networks and implicit representations. Yeah. And, and I think yeah. related to this, the question of, um, yeah, how important is it uh, to have a more heterogeneous representation of the underlying latent spaces here of the different um, yeah, modalities you combine? So, so I think I think that's a bit the question I have. Is it do you see that this is still needed, or do you observe that that the latent space is already so informative that this is not really needed? Yeah. One of these. It's, it's a good question. Uh, in general, my view is I like to know all of it, right? I I would like love a deeper understanding, and it's really interesting you bring this up uh, in terms of what, what the computer vision community is doing, and and also some of that's being lifted into doing PDE simulations. <laughs> I was just at a talk where. Microsoft has a big PD arena effort and they sort of divorce themselves from the, the need to be explainable. So let, let's, so in other words, they build like, okay, now we're going to step it with a transformer network, use these computer vision. So it's, it's really hard for me at least to walk out what, when you put all these pieces together, what happened, except that it works amazingly well. That's the only thing you know for sure. It's like they put all this architecture there. It works awesome. You're hard pressed to ever beat them. But on the other hand, you you know like, okay, it's doing something. I just can't quite disentangle how it's getting all this information together. 
I think over time, and in, and, and in fact, the pressure point for them isn't to give you an explanation, right? They don't have to explain anything. They say, look, this works. Let's go apply it. So this is the this is where I find this interesting tension between if you're a computer scientist, you might say, look, I cross-validated. I got it to work on really hard data sets. I'm moving on to the next thing I can do there. Yes. Whereas for me, and I think for you as well, is we're trying to say, yeah, but wouldn't we learn so much by understanding and detangling that? Like even this, we have a structure, but we'd really like to still detangle these decoders a little better. What's going on there that it's, how's that mapping actually happening? This is doing some, con what is what are the features? What are the things that we're really getting after here? And at least for me, that's where I like to work. And, you know, and I wasn't joking, like, you know, the, the hardest problem so far we had done is the pendulum. And now we have the next thing, right? And it feels like a big step up from the pendulum, but the pendulum was already so hard, right? And these guys doing these really fancy models are like, look, we're we're so far down the road from a pendulum. We're doing these really complex systems, but we're still trying to understand like, yeah, how is this actually working for something so simple where I actually know the answer I, and we're, we're starting to learn how to do that. So I, you know... I think the mathematicians are going to be the ones who ultimately lay down the foundations for how this is actually working. Uh, but the computer scientists are running so far ahead right now that there's a, there's a, there's a big gap, but it, you know, it'll close. I think everybody's in this game, right? We have a lot of people now playing here, right? A lot, a lot of people are in this space. So that's kind of exciting for us. Amazing comments. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Good All to see you. Any last question? I just, uh... Oh, uh, Nathan, I just wanted to make a comment because uh, I'm from, I'm from computer vision. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing that has been uh, hinted at by some researcher is the fact that the deep learning models, the neural net, uh, ha is really a disentangling, uh, uh, a disentangler. It, it basically. Uh, Due to is the way it train or is the implicit uh, invariance that it imposes, like translational and otherwise, uh, and symmetry, it actually disentangle a nonlinear uh, uh, coordinate system to become almost linear separable. That so that I don't know. It's not very vigorous, not very satisfactory in my book, but I think that might be a direction that you. You might really draw some uh, inspiration from too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I would say this: the one thing that I'm excited about for uh, where was the the one here? This is partly what I like about this one because, to your point, this one explicitly disentangles time space, and all of a sudden it works. And partly because all of our all of our numerical methods, all of our analytic solution techniques are based upon disentangle time and space, and then you can make something happen. And by construction, this is doing this. So I. And I think, yeah, you're right. There's so many clever ideas that we, it would be, but the most I can do is hand wave this right now, except for a linear case. And so part of what I'd love to do is just get a little further to understand. And if I have a really nonlinear transfer functions here, does this still all hold up? Does my intuition about the linear model still hold there? Time will tell, but I think, you know, I, Look, there's never been a better time to be a mathematician in the history of the world, I think. I, I I kind of actually believe that. You know, right? We have a, an incredible job market, so much amazing tools. We are at, I mean, maybe we're living through this revolutionary time of mathematics and, and computation coming together, right? And most people don't get to let, live through a revolution, right? I can imagine if you lived through when calculus was invented, it must have been amazing to think about, oh, we can model this and this and this with this new tool. And we're in it right now. It's uh, it's hard to keep up with what everybody's doing, but it's also pretty dang fun to to watch how fast we're moving in this field. That's good. I think it's a good conclusion. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. thank you guys all for coming. I know we're late, and uh, I really appreciate you guys attending. And if anybody's here at Turing, and just find me in the hallways or in the desk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nat. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye.